All righty. Um, so for my book review, I did the um, Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Um, so first, um, who is Don Norman and why did I pick this book? Um, so Don Norman is an engineer and a psychologist who's um, a well-known figure in the human-centered design world. Um, and I specifically picked this book because um, for those of you who are sort of interested in human-centered design, um, you know, this is a sort of a popular name and most of the sort of cognitive scientists that you'll encounter in these areas, um, you know, have probably read this book and are also probably fairly familiar with Don Norman, um, even if they have not read his book, um, they're going to be generally familiar with a lot of the principles that um, he talks about in this book. Um, so I thought this would be a good choice um, for everyone to um, at least know a little something about. Um, so human-centered design is sort of very widely applicable. Um, so you might think that, you know, um, this, you know, doesn't necessarily pertain to your research. But, you know, if you work on um, self-driving cars or chatbots for mental health, um, eventually you will have an end user who interacts with your system. Um, and again, sort of, you know, cognitive scientists understand many of these principles and um, a basic understanding of these ideas will help you sort of design more effective systems and then also collaborate well with others. Um, so I can't do a presentation about Don Norman without talking about Norman Doors. Um, so this is sort of one of the things he's very famous for. Um, and a Norman door refers to any door that's designed in such a way that makes it difficult to use. Um, so you probably have some experience with this. Um, you know, we see over here, we have this door on the on the left that has uh, handles, which would suggest that you should pull it, um, but actually you should push it um, and vice versa over here. Um, all right, so moving on, some examples of good design. Um, so fire exits um, are a, a particularly nice um, example here. Um, so people exiting buildings in a disaster tend to push the door outwards. Um, and so in the US and several other countries, it is now um, a building code requirement that fire exit doors need to open outwards. Um, but prior to this standard, um, some of these pull based exit doors have led to serious accidents where people, you know, just keep trying to exit the door and they're highly stressed and don't think about trying to um, pull it instead. Um, so another example, um, gates and industrial buildings that mark basement entries. Um, so if you're exiting in a building in an emergency, uh, people have a tendency to just continue to go down, 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 um, and then they end up in a basement um, that doesn't have an exit. Um, and so sort of a good design here indicates that you are on the main floor of a building, um, but also does not interfere with access to the basement in a non-emergency situation. Um, so this gate doesn't lock, you can just push it and walk down to the basement in you know, a normal day-to-day -day life. But um, if there's an emergency, people know they're going into the basement and they'll leave the exit instead of um, getting potentially getting stuck in the basement. All right, um, so accidents and human error. Um, so most industrial accidents are caused by, are actually caused by human error. Um, but a lot of times, um, engineers and designers treat human error as different than other types of accidents. Um, so a little bit about the nature of human error. Um, so we often, designers often understand the physical limitations of humans pretty well. Um, and we understand mental limitations of humans um, much less well. Um, so you designers often create systems that require people to have sustained alertness for hours at a time. Um, so for example, you can think of flying this plane over here. Um, they require people to have um, good memory for complex procedures that may be used very rarely. Um, so for example, you can think about um, working in a power plant and um, needing to know how to um, shut down all the systems in the event that there's an earthquake, right? And, um, you know, we expect people to maintain that sort of information in their memory, um, but, you know, obviously earthquakes strike very rarely. Um, we expect people to have quick and accurate responses in environments where people have been doing nothing for hours. 
Um, so you can think of sort of a lot of situations um, with, you know, monitoring tasks or, for instance, um, emergency response calling. Um, so, you know, if you're the call, receiving calls about emergencies, um, you may have really long periods of time where nobody calls in, right? And you're just sitting around, maybe you're looking at your phone, talking to your coworkers, and then, you know, all of a sudden there's a fire somewhere in a large building and you're getting tons of calls, right? And then we're expecting sort of those those um, call center employees to be very responsive. Um, and then lastly, we expect people to work in sort of these high workload environments where they're constantly being interrupted. Um, again, this you know cockpit is a fairly good example of that. Um, you might be focused on flying the plane and then all of a sudden you have some sensors going off that you need to attend to. All right, um, so the main point here is, you know, you have probably been bored, distracted, or tired at work at least once in your life, um, and your end users are not any different than you. Um, so when you're thinking about sort of designing systems and whatnot, don't expect higher things out of your users than you would expect out of yourself. All right, um, so understanding the causes of error. Um, so we have this thing called root cause analysis and we and it often works very well for other types of errors. Um, so if a bridge collapses, um, you know, we'll convene a team of people and then, you know, they'll figure out exactly why the bridge collapsed and what we should do differently in the future. However, when the, you know, we find out that the um, cause of an accident was a human, we often sort of stop and don't do any further investigation. Um, and so two important points here. Um, so accidents often may not have a single cause. Um, so you can think about sort of, you know, emergency response, right? And if that doesn't go particularly well, they're us usually not sort of one person who is personally responsible for why things turned out the way they did. Um, and then second, when human error is a cause, we need to understand sort of why that error has a cause. And then we need to make changes to prevent errors in the future. Um, so if you know the cause of the error is the humans have been very bored and um, understimulated and then all of a sudden need to respond quickly and accurately, um, blaming the person who made a mistake is not going to result in any differences the next time. Um, what we need to do is sort of design the system in a way that people can, um, you know, that we can mitigate that risk. All right. Um, so a better approach. Um, so this is called the five whys, and it's a process used by Toyota. Um, and basically the idea is that as soon as you find a candidate reason why there was an error, ask why that occurred, and then repeat until you find the true cause. Um, this can help you prevent you from stopping too soon and help you identify sort of true causes of errors and not just, oh, you know, it was human. A human made a mistake. Uh, I don't know. It's a it's a Toyota process. Oh, Savannah, why the the, the five whys? Just so the Toyota. idea is, yeah. So the the original idea is that sort of you complete this why process about five times. So you repeat it again and again and again. Well, okay. So that's where they get the term from. No, right. it's well, kind of successive query. Yeah. Successive querying, yeah. All right, um, so a little bit about characterizing types of error. Um, so slips, these occur when you intend to do one thing, but you actually do something else. Um, so there's, and then there's two different types of these. Um, so memory-based um, occur when you forget an important start. Um, so for example, if you have one of these cars with key fob in it, um, you often need to press the brake pedal and press the start button in order to start your car. Um, and if you just press the start button without pressing the brake, you'll start it in accessory mode and then you can't drive anywhere. Um, and then action based, you do the correct action, but apply it to the wrong object. Um, so, for example, you might think about you want to put leftovers in the fridge, but you accidentally put them in your freezer or maybe in your kitchen cabinet instead. All the time. <laughs> All right. Um, so mistakes occur when you establish the incorrect goal or plan. Um, so rule-based mistakes occur when you have an appropriate understanding of the issue, but you use the incorrect procedure. 
Um, so you might think of you're trying to update your computer and there's a little button that says reboot for updates. And then there's a little button next to it that says reboot and you click reboot instead of reboot for updates. Um, Knowledge-based mistakes occur when you misdiagnose the problem because you have incomplete knowledge. Um, so for example, you might be in the grocery store and you're trying to figure out how much produce you want to buy <clears> and you accidentally buy um, produce in kilograms instead of pounds or vice versa. Uh, Sabena, uh, I'm a little confused about if we're talking about errors that people that design systems make or people that use systems make. So the idea, so these are generally this sort of research is all focused on errors that people make. Um, Users. Yeah, People so make. that your users of systems make. Okay. And okay. the idea is that you should, um, you know, if people are regularly making these errors, you probably want to change how your system is designed in order to prevent those. So, yeah, <clears throat> a follow-up question to that. So if you're trying to say that your basis for changing the design is how a user makes um, errors, um, how would you design something novel? Say, for example, um, so when I was in 12th grade, until then I was using uh, landlines and cordless phones. Then my dad handed me a slab and said, this is your phone, right? And I did, didn't know, don't know what to do with that. Um, and then I'm then if the designer who was Steve Jobs or whoever at that point said, that's an error, we would never have an iPhone. So uh, at what point do you, uh, I guess I'm not articulating the question very well, but maybe you get what I'm trying to. Yeah, so I mean, you want to, I mean, you're never going to design completely errorless, you know, systems that never generate errors or mistakes, right? The idea you, is You could that, design systems that are radically different from the norm, right? And then how do you characterize errors? By That's observing people, in, by observing people interacting with your system. Yes, so there's a <laughs> distinction here between an outcome discrepancy, you know, something bad happens. And the um, framework that Savannah is providing here, which is an analysis of the of the two main groups of causes of that bad outcome, at least from a human capability perspective. So there's the there's the slips case, and then there's the mistakes case. So we're not we're not predicting uh, Kaushik, we're not predicting bad outcomes per se, we're trying to explain what the what the different causes of those outcomes are. And that can be a guideline for design. So all the flip stuff, you know, you should you should not be putting two highly consequential buttons next to each other that mean two different things or you know cause your system to to go into an infinite loop by accident, you just you shouldn't do that because you realize that slips are a category of error that could really upend your 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 user. And then on the mistake side, um, there's work to be done. This would be something where you could think about needing to provide training. You know, obviously you want to make your system as intuitive as possible. But the point here is you're not going to fix um, slips with training. That's a really key issue because slips are a function of the human perceptual psychomotor system. Mm -hmm. So you need to safeguard your system against slips and mistakes should be handled in a different way. I think that's the main point. Yep. Okay. And it's not, yep. it's, we're not predicting you know, what the consequence is of a mistake, because that's a domain specific thing or a slip. Okay, thanks. All righty, um, and then the last one is memory-based. Um, so this is where you have um, some forgetting that occurs either at the goal plan or evaluation stage. For example, you take the food, your dinner out of the oven and then leave the oven on. All right, um, so discussing okay. some documents. Go ahead. Right. Um, looking at some design solutions for human errors. Um, so for knowledge-based errors, um, we can design systems that help people create accurate models of the situation. Um, so people need to have sort of an accurate understanding of um, what the state of the system is and what it should be doing. 
Um, so for memory lapse mistakes, um, we can design systems that persistently display relevant information. Um, so for example, if you've ever sort of deleted a file on your computer, a lot of times it will just say, are you sure you want to delete this? Um, but it won't necessarily give you any information about what the thing is you're deleting. Um, so you can think about um, in sort of high stakes situations, you could think about designing a, did you make sure that, did you want to delete, you know, file with, you know, this property and maybe it's a screenshot of the file or something. Um, understand that social and institutional processes that um, contribute to mistakes. Um, so for example, um, if you have sort of, um, you tell three different people that, you know, we have something really important and we need it checked. And so you give them each a checklist and then have them do it sequentially. Um, people will know that, you know, other people are engaging in the checking process and then we'll check less thoroughly. Um, so if you want to use checklists, it's important to design them well. Um, make sure you put the things in the right order. Um, so, you know, if people have to like skip something on the list and then come back to it later, they might forget that they, they missed something. Um, don't rely on people to sort of have this memory that they forgot something and then come back and do it later. Um, so something that has worked really well in the aviation industry is having two people who execute the checklist together. Um, so for example, you might have one person whose job is to read the checklist and check things off. And then the other person's job is to check and make sure that the instruments are working. Um, and then you also have to sort of overcome some social and institutional objections checklist. Um, so again, they have been quite successful in aviation, um, but they, you know, there are some uh, challenges with sort of implementing them in uh, medical context. Um, so you wanna reward people who report errors and problems. Um, so you need some anonymous reporting mechanisms. Um, so there are some anonymous reporting um, approaches for um, reporting aircraft um, stuff related to aviation. Um, and you specifically wanna not punish people who identify errors or problems. Um, and then you also need to understand sort of what causes users to violate proper pro procedures and minimize those causes. Um, so a really great example of this is um, two-factor authentication systems. So if you've ever, um, you know, used a two-factor authentication, they often, um, you know, you need to be present at the computer system. You need to type in your username and then your password. And then you need cell phone service or, you know, sometimes internet service to receive the two-factor authentication prompt. And they're also frequently typed. So for example, if you have a bunch of computers located in a building with no um, no Wi-Fi, no, um, you know, no cell service, um, you're gonna have people who sit in front of the computer, they're gonna type in their username and password, and then they're gonna quickly run outside while left logged in to go accept their two-factor authentication prompt. And, you know, in your attempt to create more security, you have created a massive vulnerability because these people are leaving, you know, they're, you know, they might have a, you know, if you have a card, for example, to log into your computer, you're leaving that unattended, right? Or, you know, maybe you have your password up. So, you know, understanding that, you know, the true cause here is that we don't have any cell phone service or, you know, we don't have any Wi-Fi we can come up with a better solution, which would be, you know, install a Wi-Fi router in this building. And then, you know, people won't have to go outside to accept their two-factor authentication props. Yeah, let me just add a, a little bit here. First of all, what, what's the year on this? This is like 1980s or something, isn't it? What year is this book? 1990? Oh, um, let me fix this. Um, uh, it's, but that, that really is essential to what I was gonna say. The, the, the point is that, People are often not following procedures because they are trying to work around to achieve something that everybody wants to achieve, right? It's, this is, these errors are not caused by a bunch of malicious people who are trying to cause problems in your system. They're trying to get around rule-based constraints in your system that haven't properly considered all of the context that could limit their ability to comply with the procedures. So be sure to, you know, appreciate that. Um, and in another book, uh, Savannah, what is the year on this? It's not that reason is that much later, but it, what is the year on this? But I think the one I have is early 2000s, um, but there are several okay. different versions of it that have been updated. Okay. 
So an another place to look if this kind of thing intrigues you is James Reason's book on human error. And he'll explain some of the, um, the way in which the, the social system and the institutional organization encourages people to, to make an error, um, not because they're trying to be bad, but because they're trying to be efficient. And there are several famous um, um, mortalities that have resulted from this kind of um, bending of the rules. Alrighty. Um, so you, in general, you want to design systems with the expectation that people are going to make some errors. Um, so you want to understand sort of the causes of errors and maybe adjust your system design. Um, you might want the system to do sensibility checks. Um, so for example, if you're designing a software that's intended to be used for nurses to order prescriptions um, in a hospital, you might want to make sure that the um, drug, you know, dosing amount that has been entered um, is not toxic. Um, so for example, a lot of drugs, um, you know, are very good for you at therapeutic doses, but if you accidentally type an extra zero, they can be toxic. Um, you wanna make sure that people have the ability to easily reverse actions. Um, so if you realize you made a mistake, you should be able to undo that. Um, make it easy for users to discover that errors or problems um, are arising and you wanna help users complete actions properly. All right, um, so then a little bit about evaluating systems. Um, so how should I evaluate systems? Um, in general, you do not wanna do this with a focus group um, and you do not wanna do this by directly asking users about their experience with the system. And so why don't we wanna do those things? Um, so people like to find causes for why things occur. Um, you probably have some experiences with this. You probably have all sorts of interesting um, conclusions about why different things occur in your life. Um, however, people sort of often assign the wrong cause. Um, so consider the following scenario. You have a system that has been designed and it performs different operations when you press the enter key and then when you press the return key on your keyboard. You frequently press the enter key instead of the return key. What is the problem? Um, so most users here are going to blame themselves for pressing the wrong key. They're going to say something like, oh, I'm stupid. I, you know, I definitely should have pressed that different key. Um, but, you know, if you sort of analyze performance across a lot of different users, you might discover that all of your users are doing this on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, if you're in the initial stages of system design, a better option is to change how you've designed uh, the program so that, you know, the enter and return keys aren't doing dramatically different things. Um, so, you know, if you have a bunch of users and you've asked them to, uh, you know, say you're in, um, you're in a testing phase and you release this and you tell all your users, hey, we're testing this new technology, tell us if you have any problems. They're not going to report frequent errors that they make with the system. They're going to report things like, um, I clicked this menu and it didn't work. And the reason is because they're going to assign blame to themselves for making a mistake. All right, um, so what should we do instead? Um, observe people's performance interacting with your system. Um, so step one, you might want to identify a baseline system for comparison. Um, step two, identify who your users are going to be. Um, and you might need to provide these users with sort of relevant training about your new software. Um, step three, identify a set of tasks for analysis. Um, step four, systematically measure performance while users interact with your system. Um, step five, perform the same set of evaluation with the baseline system. Step six, compare performance using objective performance measures. Um, step seven, examine logged user behaviors while they're interacting with the two systems. And then step eight, use your insights to improve your software or product. So let's look at an example real fast. Um, so you've developed an improved software for entering and maintaining patient information. Um, so step one, you pick a, you decide that you wanna use a pre-existing software that's currently used at a local hospital. Um, step two, you uh, might select your user group as nursing assistants who frequently enter patient information. Um, step three, you wanna pick two different, you know, several, maybe just one, maybe several um, different sets of tasks to analyze. Um, so you might pick um, the tasks of entering new patient records and then updating existing patient records. 
All right. Um, so step four, locate some users, have them perform their requested tasks and measure their performance. Um, so for example, you might measure how long it takes users to create new records. Um, you might measure how long it takes users to update existing records. Um, you might also log, for instance, keystrokes um, or mouse clicks, um, for example, to you know identify whether or not people are sort of um, clicking down all the wrong menus, trying to find things, et cetera. Um, step five, replete the measurements with your other system. Um, step six, you're going to compare the performance between the two groups. Um, step seven, you might want to examine your logged user behaviors. Um, so you might notice any frequent mistakes that the users are making. Um, and then most importantly here, you want to avoid assuming that those errors are going to go away with more practice, uh, because in a lot of cases they won't. And even if they sort of necessarily like some of them improve over time, um, if people are sort of in a high stress emergency situation, um, those errors might come right back. Um, and then step eight, you might want to use these insights to sort of improve how your software is designed and make it better for your users to use. And with that, I will take some questions. So I'll, I'll does the group have any? Because I've got, I've got a big one. It's an exciting one, isn't it? <laughs> so, so what's wrong with this, Savannah? Just like I asked Chaturangi, what's, what, what do you think, Norman, because this is still 2000, you, so you said. So what, what sort of issues do you think are important in usability that Norman wasn't really attending to? I believe I have an interesting addition. <laughs> that we, that we, okay, so first of all, fantastic thing, really, you know, good to learn. This is, I'm adding, you know, adding one fun factor to it. So I'm, I'm recommending a movie name is The Invention of Lying. So, lying. lying. Yes. Okay. So the story starts with a world where nobody know how to lie. <laughs> they, they don't learn it. Okay. Now the hero of the movie who got, you know, sacked from his you know, office, and uh, his, you know, owner of the home, or, you know, apartment says, hey, you have to give $800 tomorrow, otherwise you'll be kicked off. And he has $500 in his account. So he went to the bank, and in the counter, there's a lady. They say, okay, how much you want? The, you know, link on internet is not working, tell me how much you want. Uh -huh. And he said, hey, I need $800. And the lady, the county, didn't give it to him. <laughs> and the internet come back, it says it's five hundred dollar, but as you said, it must be true. There's some problem with our system. <laughs> that man came out from the bank with this note. What did I do? <laughs> I just invented something, <laughs> and then the story goes on. Okay. So, but it's an interesting story. Watch it, and then probably rethink. You know, uh, the perfect system and imperfect. System. Yeah. Very nice analogy. Yeah, yeah. So a lot, of, lot of things are there, but I'm not talking about. It. Yes, well, so work around. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in addition to you know some contemporary movies we might bring there. So what, what's wrong with this, Savannah? Um, so in general, sort of he's focused on a lot more sort of evaluation of physical products. Um, and I would like to see a little bit more discussion about sort of usability of software. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so software and sort of associated types of problems. Yeah, I think he, to, you you have to sort of interpret everything that Savannah said in terms of knowing Norman's history and his history really goes back to 1960s human attentional processes. Yes, 1960s. And I, I want to say something else about him in a minute because I'm about to trash him, but before I, but let me trash him first and then I'll, and then I'll repair the, the problem. Um, so, you know, he tends to have a model of cognition that's focused on the individual agent and not as um, sensitive to the problems of um, task dependencies distributed across agents. Um, some later work that he did addressed the problem of distributing attention between your head and physical devices. I did mention this. I didn't cite it, but I did mention it to you guys. So I think his notions of distributed cognition are pretty thin. I don't see anything. I don't recall anything in there about language, Savannah, um, or you know, conversation or the work that goes on in conversation. And so that would really limit you know, any insights there um, for their applicability to chatbots and things like that. 
Um, now let me say something nice because it's really, really, really important that I say something nice because this is a very important thing that he did. Um, Don Norman, along with, oh, I can't remember Lindsay's first name, and, and, and Rummel Hart. So Lindsay Norman and Rummel Hart started a cognitive science group in mm, like the 70s or something. And Jeff Hinton was there and um, gosh, um, Keith Holyoke was there and Deidre Gettner was there and James Shanto, which isn't a name you would know, a, an enormous amount of leading cognitive scientists did postdocs at this original cognitive science institute in San Diego. And so you remember when I was talking to you about sort of organizing the cognitive science research communities by location, you have to consider San Diego and, and in particular, Don Norman's role in, in creating that as a center of cognitive science is really, really important. Despite the fact that he has this kind of he has an almost um, between the ears focus on human cognition that kind of bothers me. Subsequent work with, with uh, Zhai Zhi Zhang, um, who works in medicine, by the way, um, addresses, addresses this distribution of attention with artifacts. But I think it's a little bit narrow for some of the applications that, that we do here, especially with the chatbots. Um, and then, you know, on, and then he kind of talks about the institutional issues. I haven't read this book in a really long time, but reason, James Reason is going to be better on that. And what you have to appreciate is the effect of performance and efficiency requirements on human work. So, for example, in the patient mental health care chatbot situation, for sure, we have a shortage of healthcare workers, we have a shortage of clinicians, and throughput and, and not making an error is a big pressure on their performance. And so I don't think he really has the, um, the appreciation for the constraints on performance that are guiding people to do certain things and guiding you to augment or offload some of those demands. With, with technology. So there's a place to go, I think. Nevertheless, as Savannah pointed out, you know, this is this fits into the category of, you know, a book all cognitive scientists know about for sure is the, the design of everyday things. No? No? Okay. Go ahead. No, no, I would, go ahead. I have a question. So uh, Savannah mentioned that some of the errors uh, happen in situations where um, you need to perform a complex procedure in a emergency situation and the humans might tend to make a mistake due to not having done that procedure mm -hmm. and the memory issues. So um, has Don Norman provided a solution for those kinds of? I, I don't know, Savannah, what, what, if what Norman is saying about those rare things. I can tell you this, this is a problem in our society now. So as we have tried to become more efficient and eliminate support staff we've provided apps for those functions and and everybody needs to master these separate apps for these functions and i just read an article i was going to post it for the group so that you would uh, be aware of this but for example in our world um one app for changing my healthcare settings once a year that I use at the university. Another app that I have to master for uh, submitting grades. How often does that happen? Three times a year. Another app for submitting travel reports. And by the way, these are all different from Wright State when I go here. And, and the overhead on these apps that look familiar to the person who designed them, but are <laughs> rarely used by the consumer is going to become a problem in our work lives. And you probably experienced this yourself. We have a new system now for submitting um, in IRB applications, human subjects review, and a new system for submitting grant applications and on and on and on. Usually when I have that kind of situation, I put that task at the bottom of my stack. <laughs> I don't do it. So I, is there any is there any solution? Does Norman recommend? I mean, I would say don't so, do this. <laughs> 
in general, yeah, make the procedures simpler to do. Um, don't expect sort of in general, it's not a good idea to have a lot of board humans that you expect to respond fairly accurately to rare things. So if you can <laughs> give the humans um, something else to do when they are not, you know, responding to sort of emergency situations. Um, so you can think about like, um, you know, front desk staff who might have, you know, other types of tasks to do um, when they're not sort of working with patients, for example. Um, but yeah, in general, sort of responses to rare um, rare events are going to continue to be a problem. Um, typically, you're going to have to train people how to do those things. Um, so, you know, earthquakes might occur frequently, but, you know, people probably go to training on, you know, how to how to shut things down in the event of an earthquake more frequently. Yeah, yeah. So and space practice. So um, we're going to have to go. I'm just going to mention one thing. Just a fun fact. Um, so I guess we would be, I guess this would be about 19, mid 90s. And Don Norman gave a talk. Um, he was participating in a summer institute that we were holding at SUNY Buffalo when I was there. And SUNY Buffalo had, um, we have um, um, tunnel, not tunnels, but um, you know, pathways above ground because of the snow, right? And, and they're enclosed in glass and the doors are glass. And so, you have glass doors that have signs on them that say push or pull, but the glass is transparent. So you can see pull even when you're supposed to push. And, and that is a conflict of the kind that Savannah was talking about. And um, I was guiding Don Norman through the, through the uh, skyways here and he saw this and we stopped and took a picture of it and it would have been exactly conversant you know con coincidental with the the interest that he was pursuing in, in his book so yeah so fun fact okay thank you savannah i think we all have to go to class the other class thank you